I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of first word news. Rudy Giuliani, who recently joined President Trump's legal team, says Mr. Trump's lawyers are open to him sitting down for an interview with special counsel Robert Mueller, but they need assurances that the questioning would be fair and limited in scope. Giuliani spoke as the team loses its lead lawyer in the probe, Ty Cobb. He'll be replaced by Clinton impeachment lawyer Emmett Flood. Mike Pompeo attended his ceremonial swearing in as Secretary of State today. He promised staffers his administration will not repeat the mistakes of the past. Pompeo replaces Rex Tillerson, who was fired by President Trump in March. Two black men arrested for sitting at a Philadelphia Starbucks without ordering settled with the city for a symbolic $1 each and a promise from officials to set up a $200,000 program for young entrepreneurs. The arrest of Rashawn Nelson and Dante Robinson on April 12th led to protests in Philadelphia and around the U.S. over racial profiling. At least five members of the National Guard from Puerto Rico were killed today after their cargo plane crashed in Savannah, Georgia. The Associated Press reports they'd recently left the U.S. territory for a mission on the mainland. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter. In New York, I'm Mark Crumpton. Bloomberg Technology is next. Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Tesla reports first quarter results and says it's overcome the battery bottleneck that botched its earlier production goals. Plus, Cambridge Analytica shutters. We will discuss how the data firm can still be in legal trouble after closing down operations. And shares of Apple turned in the best performance since February on earnings results. We'll discuss where the tech giant goes from here. But first, to our lead, Tesla shares flat after hours. After initially spiking, Tesla reported quarterly revenue that beat analyst estimates and said it produced the Model 3 at a rate of more than 2,000 cars for three straight weeks in April. The electric car maker forecast it will generate cash in the second half of this year as production of Elon Musk's critical Model 3 gains traction. Tesla is on track to make 5,000 sedans a week in about two months, according to a letter to shareholders on Wednesday. Joining us now from New York, Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Business Week. And in Portland, we've got Ed Niedermeyer of Bloomberg View. So, Max, you know, big goals laid out here. First, the 5,000 a week, 5,000 car a week target, plus saying that they uh, will start generating cash in the second half of this year. Do you buy it? Yeah, I mean, this is this has been the line that Tesla has been sort of putting forward for for the last couple of months. Um, I think uh, you know many people have observed that 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 th the uh, 5,000 uh, unit goal is a big if. As, as you say, it's more than double where they are right now. Now uh, Musk is saying if they hit that goal, if they get expenses in line, then they'll be profitable. But it, but you know these are this would be a huge jump, and Tesla has had trouble um, in the past. You know, frequently revising these targets. So so we'll see. I'd say it was a, a, a sort of meh announcement, not not too good, not too bad, which is why you're seeing the 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 stock kind of not moving much at all. Ed, what's your read here? Yeah, well, um, I think they're counting on, you know, the deep reserves of optimism that a lot of people feel towards this company. Um, a lot of people feel like, you know, anything that Elon Musk uh, and his companies put their mind to, they can accomplish. Um, I would caution, however, that, uh, you know, manufacturing experts um, sort of, uh, it's a little harder for them to be uh, so optimistic because on, on just a fundamental level, when you go into manufacturing a new car without doing all the validation and testing that the auto industry typically does over a period of four or five years, and you sort of just figure it out as you go along, it's very difficult to, to make these kinds of big, big jumps and these big progress. So um, I, I feel like they're kind of, you know, almost a year into the production of this vehicle, uh, they're still struggling. I, you know, it's impossible to rule anything out, but uh, I remain pretty skeptical. Now, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the executive turnover at this company and reports that Elon Musk has, you know, sort of taken back charge. You know, who really is Max in charge of Tesla right now as we understand it? The 
Elon Musk. I mean, and and not just Elon Musk in a in a broad uh, sort of grand pronouncement sense, but in a, in a very granular sense. If you, if you look at that memo that he sent um, just a couple weeks back, um, it's very specific, saying that 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 Musk is going to be going to sort of mid-level managers. He wants them to talk to him directly. He wants them to be able to justify even very small expenses directly. Um, that's an approach that has worked for him uh, in the past. SpaceX, you know, he's he's the main rocket designer at this very large aerospace company, um, and it's it's what he did with the uh, previous cars, the the Model S and the and the first generation Roadster. The thing is, you know, making a car obviously is a is a is a complicated process. It's one where there's a lot more automation than there is in any of the other uh, manufacturing endeavors that 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 Musk has been involved with previously. And let's not forget, you know, we're expecting other Tesla vehicles to be unveiled. Ed, you know, how will Tesla pull back on CapEx and build capacity to produce 5,000 cars a week at the same time that we're also expecting to see the Semi as well as the Model Y, the compact SUV? I mean, yeah, they, they, you, you can't, right? I mean, you can't continue to expand, especially when they're pulling out um, automation that they sort of initially put in. They're pulling that out. They're putting in new automation, new uh, sort of more manual processes in. Um, so they're, they're changing things up as, as they go along. And, and in the manufacturing business, you know, you want to buy once and cry once. And, you know, Tesla's bringing this Silicon Valley sort of iterative approach and I think you know you can iterate around the margins of a production system but but if you're really doing it fundamentally uh, you know the costs add up really quick it's a capital intensive low margin business and and I think that you know they've also really just kind of dove headlong into a lot of these big projects and from what I understand uh, they're currently working on uh, you know looking at plans to oper uh, open plants elsewhere around the world and I think that's really uh, worrying if they're continuing to get ahead of themselves uh, trying to open new new vehicle lines and new plants uh, without really sort of getting the one that they have on a solid footing. Now, speaking of who's in charge, Max, we are 25 minutes or so now away from the earnings call beginning, and Elon Musk has tweeted about SpaceX, um, tweeting, the SpaceX crew dragon ships to the Cape in about three months. He's got a lot on his plate. Yeah, yeah, and you know, not just SpaceX and Tesla, which we've talked about, but there are all these sort of little side projects, um, and, and you know, some of them uh, sort of more funnier, uh, quirkier than others. The 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 c comedy uh, venture that that's been sort of rumored. Um, the the uh, the the thing is that that this is sort of part and parcel with, you know, as far as investors are concerned, you know, Elon Musk has been doing this for a long time. And, you know, while there there could be, you know, questions about focus, I mean, it, he definitely appears to be focused on, on production right now. Um, just to the point about automation, one one interesting thing in the earnings uh, that's coming out of the earnings just, just now is the idea that this human sort of surge, these additional workers that they added to supplement and fix whatever problems had come with automation is temporary. And the hope is that, that the, the sort of automation vision will eventually come to fruition, which is key to keeping expenses low if they want to hit all these crazy goals. Meantime, uh, Tesla's dealing with service complaints. You know, what are you going to be watching over the next few months to see if Tesla can or, you know, as you, you know, you seem to believe likely can't hit some of these goals? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, on the service side, too, I mean, Musk is number one boss there, too. You know, their head of sales and service left recently, and, and Musk took his position. So he's in charge of that, too. I mean, you know, it's easy. Again, you know, Elon Musk is a, is a brilliant, accomplished guy, um, but, you know, he's also a human, and he has limits. You know, given the extent of the manufacturing prob uh, you know, problems, which I think is the real focus, and I think, you know, uh, there'll be some... Some more reporting, uh, I think, coming out about that that kind of illustrates sort of the, the depth of those problems. You know, this, the service is important. They have to keep their customers happy. But I think on a fundamental level, uh, manufacturing is the challenge. Uh, Elon Musk's track record with manufacturing is not great. And, and I think the other key point is that, is that, you know, with the stock continuing to sort of go sideways at best, um, it's really hard to offer the sort of plush packages of stock options, uh, or it's getting harder to, to, to bring in the talent that they really need to sort of even begin to turn the situation around. So, so that's all pretty troubling. All right, another tweet from Elon in response to uh, a TechCrunch article about the results. La, la, la. Um, we are going to be listening to this call uh, 20 or so minutes from now. We will bring you any headlines as we have them. Ed Niedermeyer of Bloomberg View and Max Chafkin of Bloomberg Business Week. Thank you both.
Now, another top story of the day, the political consulting firm at the heart of the Facebook data manipulation scandal is shutting down. In a statement released today, Cambridge Analytica says it filed applications to begin insolvency proceedings in the UK. The company cites, quote, numerous unfounded accusations about its role in the Facebook fallout as a major reason for ceasing operations. It says it's being vilified for activities that are not only legal, but generally accepted as standard components of online advertising. Joining us now from London, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. So Caroline, we reiterate here that Cambridge Analyta continues to say it did nothing wrong. Precisely. It says due to the siege of media focus, which I guess we're adding to right now, it drove away all of their customers, all their clients, but still they stand by the fact that they did nothing illegal. Remember, they were accused of improperly gathering data on some 87 million people, and they said, look, these were, we haven't done anything illegal. They have unwavering confidence, they say, in particular, on their employees that they ethic acted ethically and lawfully and as you say they say they're being vilified I mean this is notable that they are therefore commencing insolvency bankruptcy proceedings not only in the UK and the US they say they're going to stand by the obligations to their employees Emily um, including notice periods severance terms but it seems that they're just no longer viable are they facing potential criminal charges criminal proceedings they are if they've done something illegal and this is what the ICO the Information Commission office here in the UK is investigating them for they got a warrant to be able to go into their servers and see how they managed to acquire the personal data of up to 87 million people did they do it in a wrong fashion overall and did they do it therefore illegally if they did it illegally well the ICO does have the power to bring into question it they can prosecute on a, on a legal basis so clearly there is potential for for legal ramifications here if they're seen to have done wrong. I add that they did, interestingly, hire a QC, that is a Queen's Counsel, that's a very high lawyer here in the UK, basically a barrister, to do an independent investi investigation. They say that QC saw that none of the evidence, it said, was not borne out by the facts. So they think that they are in the clear. We'll see whether the ICO agrees. All right, Caroline Hyde for us in London. Caroline, you are sticking with us. Can talk to you a little bit about Spotify. Coming up, Spotify reporting earnings just a month after its direct listing. We're going to break the results down next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Nokia announced plans to sell off a digital health business it acquired just two years ago to capitalize on the popularity of wearable fitness trackers like those made by Fitbit. Since then, however, wearable makers have struggled as competitors like Apple introduce more similar features on their smartwatches. Nokia said it's selling the digital health business to Eric Carreal, co-founder of a French startup that Nokia acquired back in 2016. Streaming music giant Spotify reported 75 million premium users in the first quarter, leaving investors disappointed in its first earnings results as a public company. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde in London. And here with me in San Francisco, our deals reporter Alex Barinka. So shares are down. But this is in line with what Spotify forecasts. So why are they so disappointed? It is. And, and I don't know if it's necessarily disappointment, um, but it, I think it might have a bit to do with how this company got public. You'll remember Spotify went public in a direct listing. They basically just said, hey, all of our existing shareholders can sell their shares now on the open about a month ago. Not as many holders sold as expected in the early trading. Now the stock is up 12% from its open price. I have a bit of a suspicion that the good old fashioned profit taking is going on here. People are seeing this stock up at 170 bucks today at the close. They're taking this opportunity to potentially sell off because look, when I dig deep into the numbers, Everything is in line. Everything's in line with company guidance. It's in line with analyst estimates. So I am uh, left scratching my head a little bit as to what folks are really disappointed with unless they're expecting really astronomical growth with users. Well, and that's the question, you know, will Spotify have breakout growth of some kind in the future, Caroline, or is this, is this the norm? Now that they have gotten to this side, will growth only sort of plateau? 
Yeah, well, growth, I mean, wasn't really plateauing. If you look at premium subscribers up 45%, they've promised to continue this sort of growth in, of about a third in terms of premium users. Monthly active users continuing to grow about 30%, although that's what they're promising for the second quarter. This is a com company that's going to continue to deliver as it promised. And my mind boggles slightly. We got these numbers that they said were expectations for Q1 two weeks or less than that before Q1 was over. What did they expect? That they were suddenly going to r ramp up user base phenomenally in the last couple of days and be able to punch the lights out into these particular expectations? Uh, you would think that potentially that would be market manipulation in some way. So they really had to live up to expectations. But analysts clearly either have decided that they wanted to see a little bit more, they wanted a, an under-promise and over-deliver, or indeed many, uh, many of the shareholders are indeed taking profit as Alex says but I think there are ex heady expectations from analysts going forward we've got plenty of buy writings out on this stock if you dig into the Bloomberg analyst recommendation it's my favorite one if you look at the Bloomberg and you can see you've got hardly any sells I think you've just got one sell out there you've got 12 buys you've got an awful lot of holds on this particular stock and the price target is getting close to where the price currently is but many of these banks are saying look buy into this stock because of the subscriber growth it's just at the beginning that's what Morgan Stanley said 1.3 billion smartphone users well they've got some 75 million premium users and some well, more, in excess of well, 170 million users in general you've got plenty of room to grow as of course Tim Cook was telling you for the rival Apple shares still down though more than six and a half percent I did speak to Tim Cook uh, before the earnings call yesterday about Spotify as the other big competitor now in the streaming music race. It certainly has turned into uh, somewhat of a two horse race globally. And I asked how worried is he now that Spotify is a public company that they are posting um, the kind of growth that we're talking about. And he said I see it differently than perhaps everybody else sees it. If you take all the streaming services in the world and add up subscribers you get a very small number relative to the world population. So the big challenge is not competition with each other. It is convincing a lot of people that don't subscribe to a streaming music service to subscribe to one. And that's where the big opportunity is. I think we're in a great position to do that. Uh, certainly a great way to spin, but do you buy it? Uh, potentially. I mean, remember, Spotify is the market winner. It's a nice thing for Tim Cook to say <laughs> as the, the horse who's perhaps behind in the race. but. The, where I see a bit of traction uh, with what Spotify's been doing, if you look back in the past month, they've minted a deal with Hulu. They're packaging their music subscription with Hulu subscription video, and they're selling that now as a, as a combined premium offering. So when you think about the generation that it makes sense for them to be targeting, these smartphone users, folks who are used to perhaps cutting the cord and having a slew of different subscription services, that uh, take from Tim Cook does make sense. Whether or not Apple's winning, it seems like they might need a bit more content, which again is where you've seen Spotify really try to push in outside of just music into podcasts. And now with this tie up with Hulu, they're pushing a video in the Spotify app right now. You can watch uh, Hulu's shows right now. Well, and interestingly, Tim Cook also talked up Apple's exclusive video content, exclusive radio content, um, exclusive interviews that they do with artists. Um, you know, Caroline, are there particular global territories or regions that Spotify expects to grow more in particular? China, I think, is where analysts are really focusing. Remember, one of their biggest investors is Tencent, and they think that, therefore, a deal can be done with Tencent Music. They could really grow their focus over there. I was interested in the breakdown of premium users at the moment. The bulk, about 40% are here in Europe. The, about a third is over with you in the US. But then it's Latin America, and then it's the rest of the world. I think you will see more emerging markets. We saw Israel open up in March. You saw South Africa open up in March. We are going to see an expansion territorially, and, as you say, more innovative ways ways of, of cashing in and making money. All right, Caroline Hyde for us in London. Alex Barenka here in San Francisco. We'll keep watching. Coming up, now that we are in the final stretch of tech earnings, we're going to show some Bloomberg terminal charts that you need to see. This is Bloomberg. We've been covering the big tech earnings here on Bloomberg Technology. Now that most companies have reported their results for the quarter, I want to get to our Bloomberg stock reporter, Abigail Doolittle, for some insights and some highlights. Abigail, uh, we've been following the Bloomberg uh, Top Live blog on Tesla. Tesla making some big, big promises this quarter about production and cash generation later this year. What are you seeing? 
Well, interesting because, of course, Tesla basically pre-announced so relative to the actual uh, adjusted earnings, that loss, and of course the revenue number beating ever so slightly. But as you mentioned, a few big announcements. But before we dig into one of those, let's hop into the Bloomberg and take a look at an ongoing theme for Tesla, which are the Tesla bulls versus the Tesla bears. You can view this chart using the GTV function. What we're looking at here in blue, uh, the Tesla stock right around 300, and then in white, the short interest. So back Back in the day, about a, uh, probably a year or two years ago, the Tesla short interest had been at about 35% of the float, then dipping down more recently, closer to 22% ahead of the stock uh, dropping, but more recently climbing again. So those Tesla bears uh, back out in uh, full force, uh, up about at 30% of the float is once again short. So the bears are betting that some of these big bets won't be pledged. And looking beyond production, you of course mentioned uh, cash flow, Elon Musk, CEO Elon Musk, the company, saying that for the second half of this year that they may uh, actually produce cash because, of course, one of the other big stories here, the cash burn. Let's hop back into the Bloomberg and use the GTV function and take a look at what's happening here for the cash burn because it built in a big way. That's a negative thing here for this first quarter. So what we're looking at here is free cash flow. Now, outside of this one uh, quarter here back in September of 2016, we see for the most part that ca Tesla has been burning through cash, and that is one of the big themes for the uh, bears. Now, at the end of the last year, it had really moderated, but once again, right now, they uh, burnt through $1 billion in cash, Emily, so it's difficult in some ways to see how they are going to be free cash flow positive by the end of the year, but who knows, with that Model 3, and I believe that's what they're talking about, that that's really going to be delivering that electric vehicle uh, to the masses, maybe that will work. Apple has been the other stock everybody's talking about today. Of course, shares ended the day up on the back of strong, or perhaps I should say simply stable earnings. Um, yesterday, what did you see with Apple today? So I love your characterization of stable earnings because while it wasn't the disaster that people were looking for and they did beat exactly right, Emily, stable, but that's what they needed to do. And then that $100 billion buyback. But something that really stood out to me in the quarter, it's not just about the iPhone, something that they're really trying to ramp up services. Let's hop back into the Bloomberg and use the GT function and this is uh, the services revenue for each of the quarters and we see for the latest quarter at a record high at uh, about 9.2 billion dollars so uh, those iTunes and iBooks and all of those uh, services that they are providing that's really starting to uh, you know make a dent out of the quarter overall more than 60 billion dollars uh, and nine billion dollar contribution and growing Emily so that's a positive and just quickly the the broader tech sector I mean just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a bubble potentially being burst, and yet all these stocks seem to have recovered in the last week or two. Well, they've covered to some degree. They have not climbed back to those all-time highs, but to your point, there is strength for technology. And if we quickly hop back into the Bloomberg and use that GTV function, what we're looking at here in the bottom panel is the S&P 500 tech sector relative to the S&P 500. We see that tech is outperforming overall, and we see that here in white. There's that S&P 500 sector up 5% on the year. The S&P 500 down slightly, so okay. tech is one pocket of strength. Abigail Doolittle, our Bloomberg Stocks reporter, thank you so much for that update. Coming up, another deep dive into Tesla's first quarter report comparing the electric car maker to its peers. It's kept pace with Ford and GM. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of first word news. The president of the International Committee of the Red Cross says the situation in both Syria and Iraq is now at a tipping point where there can be a consensus to stop the war or things could get even more dangerous. I have the impression that we are at, a, at an interesting threshold moment which will reframe the way we do humanitarian work in Iraq and Syria. Nearly 400,000 people have been killed in the seven-year conflict. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres held talks with British Prime Minister Theresa May in London. They discussed a range of issues, including working closely to reestablish international norms against the use of chemical weapons. The Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte says the European Commission's proposed new seven-year $1.36 trillion budget is unacceptable because the Netherlands will pay a larger share. The Netherlands contributes more to the EU than it gets back. 
In Spain, the Basque militant group ETA says it has completely dissolved. ETA conceded in a letter that it failed to resolve the Basque political conflict. The group is blamed for killing more than 850 people in its 60-year campaign to establish a Basque homeland in northern Spain and southern France. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 7.30 p.m. here in New York, 7.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. I'm joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Uh, well, uh, health and consumer stocks weighed on U.S. markets and the Fed, of course, uh, stayed on hold as everybody expected. So uh, U.S. equities closing like this. We had the uh, S&P and Dow uh, both off about seven-tenths of one percent. Uh, the Nasdaq also off about four-tenths of one percent. Tesla, of course, uh, reporting after the close with record revenue. And we'll have uh, more on that story for you in a little while. Now, as for this part of the world, well, we've got uh, ASX futures pointing ever so slightly higher. Uh, Nikkei futures... Uh, higher, uh, pointing a little lower. Japan, of course, closed today. The Aussie dollar hovering just below 75 cents US. Quick check in on commodities. We've got oil slipping below $68. This is as US crude inventories build up. Uh, gold holding just above $1,300. Uh, elsewhere today, we'll be looking out for the Australian trade surplus, expected to widen a little later on. And uh, Steve Mnuchin, of course, is in China to talk trade. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Back to our top story. Tesla out with first quarter revenue that beat estimates. Musk saying he's targeting 5,000 Model 3s a week in two months, but admits it's very difficult to predict production. If Tesla can get to 5,000 cars a week, the company will be profitable and cash flow positive in the third and fourth quarters. Aside from the Model 3, the Model S and Model X are still hot. Orders rose in the first quarter. Joining us now in Detroit, Bloomberg's David Welch. David, we are uh, waiting for uh, Elon Musk to start speaking on the call minutes from now. You know, what's your overall take here, given the big promises and the fact that, you know, they've been broken a few times over the yes. last year? It's more of the same if you really look at it. Uh, if you look at it quickly, it sounds like, hey, we're on our way to getting the 5,000 units. That means we'll be profitable and cash flow positive in the second half. Then you read more closely in this letter, and he says, yeah, it's very difficult to predict production. Uh, we know Elon. That's been the case all along. And uh, by the way, getting to that cash flow positivity and uh, positive net income requires that. So again, it's sort of uh, a lot of ifs and buts here. And, and, and as always with Tesla, if all of that comes to pass, there will be a payoff. If not, then the, uh, the bears and the shorts will, uh, will have a, a bit of a field day with it. We didn't really learn a lot new here uh, looking at all of this in, in, in terms of that high line, what's going to happen with the Model 3, right? And that's why you saw initially shares went up a little bit because it sounded like pretty positive direction. And then maybe as people started reading the fine print, uh, they gave some of that back because it really says, hey, there's still some variables here that Tesla hasn't perhaps completely figured out. Tesla shares down slightly at the moment. So what new tidbits of information are you hoping to get on the call? I know there's some excitement that he might do some teasing about the Model Y, the compact SUV, you know, more about automation potentially. Yeah, there are some real questions here. He did say in the letter, which was very interesting, that they had cleared up bottlenecks uh, at the battery plant, and now there are bottlenecks at the assembly plant. So maybe he'll give more details on production and where they really are. He'll, he'll certainly get uh, questioned about that by the analysts who are on the call. So maybe we'll get and some detail And by the way, there. David, hang on a sec. Elon just said he's going to leave extra time for Q&A because he is very excited about talking about this rapid increase in production that he has planned. There you go. Maybe he's got good news for us on the call. One interesting thing is he said CapEx would be uh, coming down. And uh, it'll be interesting to see, are they spending more efficiently or are they just maybe ratcheting back on the time frame for Model Y, for the Roadster, for the semi-truck, some of these things that uh, they promised in the past. If, if you want to have those vehicles out, you do need to spend on, on R&D and you need to start uh, you know, really doing some engineering spending and getting things in place to get those vehicles out. And and uh, if, you, if you're 
still trying to get to 5,000 units and eventually 10,000. He said that in the letter as well. Uh, 10,000 units a week of the Model 3. You got to spend capital to get those lines up and running. And uh, you know maybe we'll get some more detail on that and, and how quickly they're going to get there. All right, Elon Musk continuing to talk on the earnings call, saying they are improving production with dramatically less CapEx. As you said, David, David Welch, thank you so much for joining us from our Detroit Bureau. We'll continue to monitor these headlines. Well, the days of the smartphone industry's double-digit growth may be over, but that doesn't appear to be stopping Apple. The company sold 52 million iPhones in the first quarter of this year, meaning units are up about 3%, despite the global smartphone market falling 2% in the last year. That's got Gene Munster of Loop Ventures making some predictions. I think we're entering a new phase around the iPhone story, and that is going to be a phase of greater predictability, so we're not going to have to sweat each quarter. Um, I, and separately, I think it's going to be lower growth, so kind of a zero to five percent growth, and uh, and that is because they had this large 800 million base. They just keep mining with a, a broad line of products. Joining me to discuss everything Apple, we've got Mike Olson, senior research analyst at Piper Jaffray, and Bloomberg Tech executive editor Tom Giles. So, Mike, I'll start with you. Piper Jaffray increasing their price target on Apple. Why? Well, yeah, as, as is often the case with the chatter from component suppliers, iPhone sales just weren't as bad as feared, and the June quarter guidance reflects a far better picture than many had painted about what the next several months could look like. So we are raising our price target to 214 on upwardly revised EPS. We recommend owning the stock here for upcoming anticipation related to a wider array of next-gen iPhones that we expect will be coming this fall. Still... The average selling price of the iPhone dropped from $796 to $728, which signals that maybe the mix isn't as tilted towards the, the you know, $999 iPhone 10. You've also got Gene Munster of Piper Jaffrey saying a new phone could cost as much as $1,400. And I spoke with Tim Cook ahead of the call yesterday, and he told me this about the price. He said, I don't have concerns about the price. I think it's price for the value that it is. Incredible product with lots of leading edge innovations that sets us up for the next decade. Mike, do you think that means a $1,400 price target is realistic? Well, I think ASPs are probably going higher. We, we haven't modeled for that just because we want to keep our estimates conservative. But, you know, investor fears related to an iPhone miss were, were really high going into the quarter, and units came in essentially in line for iPhone 10 specifically, where investors were most cautious. The company said iPhone 10 continues to be its number one selling device. So the mix continues to be solid, and the ASP was, was essentially right in line with what we're modeling. And perhaps more importantly, the June quarter guidance, which calls for revenue a couple percent above consensus at the midpoint implies that iPhone units were um, ahead of where street estimates had fallen to in recent weeks. And then looking to the fall, we expect Apple will widen the iPhone 10 out into three versions, the, the 10S, a 10S Plus, and what we're calling a 10 Lite. And we believe that could drive in investor anticipation around a better upgrade rate, and it could drive ASP uh, higher for iPhone. Begs the question, though, Tom, and I know we ask this every time the price goes up, but are people going to buy a $1,400 iPhone? That's a lot. I mean, remember how, how far Apple and the carriers have gone to disguise how much it costs. When you go in and buy a new phone, no one tells you, here's the bottom line price. They discuss it in terms of this is the monthly cost to you over the course of two years, whatever it is. So it doesn't seem like quite as much. Uh, that's, so, well, that's one of the things. Remember where they talked about there's going to be growth in the future. A lot of talk about India on yesterday's call. People in India, there's a lot of growth potential there. I'm not sure that that's going to be your high-end phone. So Apple is really, that's where this strategy of the wide range, lower end, a lot of the features that you currently find in, in, in today's iPhone 10 are ones that you'll see in a lower price device going forward. Mike, you know, do you still think there is some sort of urgency around Apple needing to diversify away from the iPhone, though, despite the fact that results were solid. I mean, obviously, we see services becoming a bigger piece of the pie. You know, does that need to continue at, you know, a significant rate, you know, so that Apple can weather the, the smartphone slump that continues to happen? I don't think there necessarily needs to be a, a next path of innovation that's instantly identified here. We think the, the next path of innovation will really just be that, that wider array of next-gen iPhones that we expect will come in the fall. Um, and then, as you mentioned, um, 
services diversification. And services revenue had a great quarter, you know, accelerated to 31% growth in the March quarter, up from 18% growth in December. And it's just a positive mix shift given the higher margin of services, a segment that, you know, now is 15% of revenue. And we believe services has the potential to be a $50 billion business by 2020, which would be slightly ahead of, of what we're currently modeling. So there's there's still definitely more potential upside there for services. It's a very different sort of rhetoric that we've heard about Apple over the last couple of years where it's been all about diversify, diversify, diversify. That new product. When's that TV coming? When's that car coming? When's AR that glasses, next big thing coming? Home speaker. You didn't hear a lot about uh, HomePod last night. You didn't hear a lot about AR. Um, he talked about health. Tim Cook talked about health care. That so was very intrigued about what's in store there. But is it going to be some new game changing product along the lines of the iPhone, the iPad, et cetera? That obviously remains to be seen. They don't seem to be sending that signal right now. But uh, what's interesting to me and, and, and our, our colleague Lena Vershivsky wrote an interesting column. He talked about how at a time when other technology companies are pouring money into R&D, to be intrusive, gimmicky, burning cash, or turning users into products. He talks about it. Apple is a rock of common sense, sobriety, dignified engineering supremacy, prudent financial and supply chain management. All stuff that sounds good if you're an investor, but not if you're someone who's looking for, like, what's that next big thing? What's the big innovation that's going to come from this, the house that Steve Jobs built? That's not the sound. That's not, you know, we're going to return $100 billion to shareholders rather than go and buy, the, you know, buy Netflix, buy Tesla, um, invest in a lot of R&D to build this new big thing. So I think it is an idea of you know, what, is, what is Apple and how are we going to think differently about Apple going forward. All right. Tom Giles, our executive editor of Bloomberg Tech, thank you, as well as Mike Olson, senior research analyst at Piper Jeffrey. All right, well, Amazon is said to be prepping a move that could be a new threat to payment services like PayPal and card issuing banks. The e commerce retailer is offering to pass along the savings it gets on credit card fees to other retailers if they use its online payment service. This, according to people familiar with the matter. Typically, merchants using Amazon service pay about 2.9% of a fee, but a long term commitment to the service could mean a lower negotiated price. Coming up, despite that latest move from Amazon, Square rang in its first quarter results. We will look at what Jack Dorsey's other company reported next. This is Bloomberg. Plenty of tech earnings to keep up with this hour. Both Square and Fitbit also reporting their first quarter results. Jack Dorsey's e-payments company beat analyst estimates with adjusted revenue, $307 million. Square also saw its first quarter payment volume jump 31%. And wearables producer Fitbit's first quarter revenue was in line with most analyst estimates, $247.9 million. The company predicting its smartwatches growing as a percent of revenue next quarter. Joining us to discuss Bloomberg Tech, Selena Wang. What's the number one top headline? From, let's start with Square. The top headline is definitely that despite these outstanding results, investors have set an incredibly high bar for this company. When shares had been on the rise. Really. Shares had been on the rise, rallied more than 40% just this year, but we saw the shares get punished after reporting sales that increased by more than 51%. Down more than 6% right now. Down more than 6% right now, exactly. And that's because they're expecting perfection right now. And the one concern here is that expenses have been increasing quite dramatically, especially in sales and marketing, as well as product development and we're not seeing margins expand as much as investors would have liked to see. Uh, that being said, we are seeing Square execute on its vision of not just being a payments platform, that it wants to be a one-stop shop for merchants to do everything from getting loans, getting food delivery, inventory management, other business software services, and we are seeing them capture an increasing share of larger merchants, and these larger merchants have more cash to spare and are spending on more, more of these products. Of these ancillary businesses, loans, food delivery, instant deposits, accounting, inventory tracking, which of those is going to be the breakout next big revenue stream? Now, some of the big drivers within that category is food delivery. They have a pretty big base of uh, food sellers, of restaurants. Many of their big multi-store retailers are actually in the food services business. 
also the Square Capital business has been growing very rapidly. A lot of the problem with the small sellers is that they aren't properly serviced by the big institutional banks and Square can step in and use their machine learning and AI to help give them the best loan and allow these sellers to pay it back through payments transactions so they don't feel this heavy burden of having to pay Square back. And that's another way they've been able to keep the loan default rate extremely low. Talk to us about Bitcoin trading. So Bitcoin trading, we did see that it actually contributed to adjusted revenue of $200,000. So it's a pretty something. small, it's something, it's not nothing. <laughs> but it does show that they're putting a real emphasis here on their Square Cash app. They want to build a big ecosystem for this. I just spoke to Chief Financial Officer Sarah Fryer on the phone and asked her about this question of, you know, what is really the ultimate vision for Bitcoin? And they really see Bitcoin trading as a way to draw in users and allow them to get into their Square Cash ecosystem and begin to use all of their other financial services. They also have rolled out a debit card that links into the Square Cash app. So they have big plans for this. Investors not impressed with Fitbit shares either today, also down despite announcing this pact with Google um, to integrate into and innovate in, in healthcare and, and wearables. You know, talk to us about that partnership and what it actually means. That is the one bright spot, and I have to say right now the details are very sparse, but what we do know is that essentially Google Cloud is working with Fitbit to try and integrate data more deeply into the healthcare system. So what does that mean exactly? So at the end of the day, the goal is that healthcare providers will be able to see data from the electronic uh, medical records and combine that data with data from Fitbit trackers so that they can come up with better decision-making tools for people with chronic illnesses. It is useful for them to be able to see a lot of that data that these trackers capture. But as you said, earnings were pretty lackluster. Investors are not happy at the end of the day. This is a company that is really squeezed from all sides from competition and they're just barely hanging on. Is it mostly about Apple, the competition? Isn't it always about Apple? <laughs> they obviously have an incredibly successful smartwatch and Fitbit has been very slow to try and come up with a smartwatch that's really appealed to consumers. The Ionic really fell flat. They have a new Fitbit Versa that's supposed to be more mass appeal smartwatch and we have yet to see whether that's going to be successful. And James Park has said that he expects smartwatches to be a bigger driver of revenue, but that's not enough yet to offset the decline in their legacy fitness tracker business. James Park, the CEO. All right, Selena Wang of Bloomberg Tech, thank you so much for those reports. Coming up, our conversation with Melinda Gates. She weighs in on the current political climate and her request for President Trump. And another update on the Tesla earnings call, Elon Musk talking up the production of battery packs. Here's what he had to say. The thing I'm most excited about is the, uh, the rapid increase in output. Um, We've got uh, just in the last uh, 24 hours at the Gigafactory managed to achieve a sustained rate of over 3,000 packs uh, per day. That's right for a week. Um, and uh, actually reached a peak hour uh, with, if, if extrapolated outward, would be a rate of over 5,000 cars per week. edition of Bloomberg Studio 1.0, I caught up with Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In their annual letter, written every year, they expressed a wish that President Trump treat women with more respect when he speaks and when he tweets. I asked Melinda what the president's treatment of women says about society and if she thinks his example could set us back. I think that the president, no matter who he or she is, has a responsibility to be a moral authority in the country and to be a role model. And so I think some of the views today coming out on Twitter from this president don't represent our views of women in society. I'm in the school system a lot, all over the country, and what principals and staff and teachers are teaching the kids is what's important in this country about not bullying, about treating people equally, having respect. But you've got to role model that at the top, and we have just made, he has just made their job a lot harder. Your name, Bill's name, have been floated as vice presidential candidates. Do either of you have political aspirations? 
zero. <laughs> None. We like where we are. We like the jobs that we're doing. We absolutely want to work, though, with whatever administration comes into that office. We need to. The U.S. government is too important around the world, and our role in the world is too important not to work with them. And so we feel like we can work hand in hand with them in partnership through the foundation. You've both said you're going to continue to keep working with this administration because you think working together is important, even though, you know, uh, in some places you may disagree. Um, aside from his treatment of women, what are your biggest concerns about this administration? This administration is making major budget cuts, proposing major budget cuts in foreign aid. The message that sends to the rest of the world about do we care about others and our ability to create markets to help countries move, ha fulfill their aspirations of moving from low to middle income country and create markets for ourselves, we're pulling back on that. So that is a big concern of my husband's and I. That was Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Catch that full conversation later today on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, airing 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. And one more highlight from the Tesla earnings call. CEO Elon Musk said that getting the company cash flow positive is, quote, not a certainty. He also mentions automation, saying he thinks costs will decrease by getting rid of production stations that are poorly suited to robotics. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.